In this study, we'll finish our discussion of biblical creationism with a closer look at Genesis in light of what we discussed last time about the age of the earth and possible translations of the word day or yom. We'll start with the creation week and then we'll discuss the creation of Adam and Eve. After that, we'll consider Noah's flood and conclude by briefly addressing the topic of dinosaurs. Verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the first verse of the Bible, we see a reference to both the finiteness of time, it had a beginning, as well as to space and matter in the phrase heavens and earth. This short verse actually does a good job of describing that space-time singularity that we believe exploded into our universe in the Big Bang. We have no way of knowing from scripture that this is how it happened, but our understanding of the universe's beginnings would imply that this verse encompasses the billions of years with which God expanded and ordered space and matter into the beautiful cosmos that we can glimpse on dark nights and through satellite photography. Verse 2. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Since the Bible specifically applies to the inhabitants of earth, it's not surprising that its account quickly shifts to the formation of our planet. Now this verse is rather vague, but it seems to refer to an earth whose land was covered by water. Scientists theorize that the earth was very hot early in its formation, and that its early atmosphere was dominated by water vapor. Once the earth cooled enough, this vapor would have condensed and fallen to the earth to form its oceans. We don't know if this ocean covered all land on earth at this point, as the Bible seems to imply, but a relatively formless earth covered with water is consistent with modern scientific theories. And this would have been long before life would thrive on our planet. Verses 3-5 through five. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. While light and the sun would have had to exist long before this point in the Earth's history, this may be referring to the point at which the Earth's early atmosphere cleared enough to let light reach the Earth's surface, and thus cause mornings and evenings on the Earth. As mentioned before, the word yom may refer to long periods of time. However, here it may just be defining a literal day as how long it takes for the earth to complete a rotation. Unlike later uses of yom in this chapter, this one doesn't appear to encompass anything more than a 24-hour day. Verses 6 through 8. Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Here we see the continued clearing and refinement of the atmosphere. The separation of the waters described here seems to be a fair description of the formation of rain clouds held within the atmosphere. And progressive creationists understand evening and morning in this context to be referring to the beginning and end of a period of time in which these events occurred. As mentioned before, a thousand years are like a day to an eternal being like God, so from his perspective the word day is accurate even if it refers to millions of years. Verses 9-10 through 10. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. This may very well be a description of processes such as plate tectonics, mountain building, volcanoes, etc. Perhaps even the breakup of the hypothesized supercontinent Pangaea. Verses 11-13 through 13. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them, after their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a third day. Obviously, this is describing the appearance of plant life. Now, vegetation, such as trees and flowers, do not appear in the fossil record until after certain animals had existed for some time. However, the first life forms which existed well before the Cambrian explosion were bacteria and single-celled algae, which are plants. 
Like other plants, algae get their food from photosynthesis and produce oxygen as a byproduct. Scientists believe that over billions of years, it was these early plants that filled our atmosphere with oxygen. So the existence of plants before animals is supported by science and explains the method by which God prepared the atmosphere for animal life. Now this passage is more specific and refers to much later plant life such as trees. Although it is possible that plants like this existed earlier than fossils show, since they're relatively fragile and don't fossilize easily, it may also be that this is an example of a simplification in the biblical account. Rather than explain the difference between single-celled algae and more complex plants like trees that came later, a more understandable creation account would have just lumped plants together into one category of creation. Since the main point of the creation account is simply to explain that God created the world, not precisely how, this generalization doesn't really make the Bible unscientific. And since we understand the days of creation to be periods of time rather than days in a week, who's to say that they can't overlap? The plant period did indeed start before the animal periods, but I don't think it too much of a stretch to think that it may have continued into them. Verses 14 through 19. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Now on the surface, this day seems very out of place. Obviously, the moon and sun and stars had already existed long before plants had started to appear. And how could there have been morning and evening and light without our sun? But if we consider that the person God revealed this account to, whether verbally or through a vision, probably would have been looking at the events from the perspective of the Earth's surface, this could be the point in time when the atmosphere had cleared enough for the sun's shape to be discernible, and dimmer lights like the moon and other stars could be seen. This explanation may seem like wishful thinking, but it's not when you look at what scientists have actually been hypothesizing about how the Earth's atmosphere developed. A 2006 Reuters article explains that according to University of Colorado scientist Margaret Tolbert, a haze of organic aerosol particles, quote, may have been a dominant feature of Earth's early atmospheric landscape from about the time of the first evidence of life 3.6 billion years ago until the rise of the oxygen content about 2.3 billion years ago. Additionally, the thick haze not only may have nourished organisms, but may have protected them from harmful ultraviolet rays. Given the widespread understanding that the algae we mentioned earlier were the primary cause of this rise in oxygen, this positioning in the creation story makes perfect sense in light of this theory, no pun intended. Verses 20-23 through 23. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created this great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. This day presents another potential difficulty when compared with the fossil record. The early appearance of fish is scientific, but birds don't appear in the fossil record until about when mammals do, and reptiles and dinosaurs appear before birds. Is this a contradiction? Certainly not if we view the ordering of these days as potentially overlapping. Again, the beginning of this day is ordered correctly. Fish do generally appear in the fossil record before land-dwelling creatures. Perhaps this day or period didn't end until partway into the next. Also, since this day doesn't say that there weren't any creatures on land, such as bugs or reptiles, it may simply be focusing on the fish and birds, since most land animals are lumped into the next day. Verses 24-31 through 31. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. 
Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Finally, we have the creation of land animals, and finally man. As mentioned before, this period may have begun before the last had ended, since it refers to creeping things which may be reptiles. Or the creation account just may not be specific enough to single out reptiles, and thus this day refers primarily to mammals. We see that God created man last although a more detailed account of this creation is saved for Genesis 2. We also see that God gave us plants to eat. While it's interesting that this passage doesn't mention animals being given for food, this omission doesn't imply that all animals were vegetarians until after the fall. Carnivorous animals have teeth obviously designed for eating meat, so it would not make sense that God intended for these creatures to have been vegetarians. That wraps up Genesis chapter 1. As we have seen, when you look at it as a generalized account of creation, as told in a way meant to be understandable to early mankind, it actually fits in with the facts of science quite well. The specific numberings of the periods of creation establish a pattern of work for God's people to follow, including a day of rest. The explanations I suggested may have seemed to tend toward twisting the Bible to fit the science, but I really don't see any contradictions here. This may not be right, but a thorough look at Genesis does not tell me that a completely literal young earth perspective is the only biblical creation theory. Rather, I think if you consider nature as another form of divine revelation, it being his creation after all, I would say that a theory interpreting the yomes as long, possibly overlapping periods is probably much closer to the truth. Of course, we won't know this for sure until we get to heaven. Let's now briefly look at Genesis 2 and consider how man fits into an old earth perspective of life. First of all, it's important to note that Genesis 2 is not a sequential sort of play-by-play -play like Genesis 1 is. Instead, it mentions creation events as they relate to telling the story of Adam. Thus, I think it is reasonable to assume that even though the sequence of Genesis 2 is different from the sequence of Genesis 1, this isn't really a problem because Genesis 2 is focused on explaining how God specially designed man to fit into his world. The thrust of the argument here isn't how or when these events occurred, but why. It's also interesting to note that the heavens and earth in Genesis 2 are said to have been created, presumably out of nothing since nothing else is mentioned, but man and animals were formed out of the ground and had life breathed into them by God. This coincides with the progressive creationist belief that life on earth did develop in a sequence starting with the building blocks such as amino acids and proteins and progressing into higher life forms, culminating in man. This doesn't mean the process was undirected, but simply that God constructed life from the matter he had created at the very beginning. The arguments of the intelligent design movement make a solid case that the development of life had to have been the result of some sort of divine intervention putting everything together. The idea that God would have made us out of precursor life forms he had already developed does not make our creation any less miraculous. With that said, does that mean Adam had parents? Many progressive creationists believe that God produced each new type of species by divinely recoding their DNA to give them the unique features that differentiated them from other genetically similar species. Thus, Adam may have had parents, but Adam was still the first human being because he was the first with human DNA. Human DNA is, after all, very similar to that of chimpanzees, yet we have substantial physical differences. The design of our spinal cord, for example, makes us uniquely suited for bipedalism. 
Or perhaps God formed each new species type from scratch, out of basic organic material, and did the same for Adam, without any biological ancestors. Whatever the case may be, and this is such a specific event that as long as the fossil record remains punctuated, we will probably never really know, I do believe that Adam was the first human being ever to exist. Additionally, progressive creationists hold the scientific view that creatures such as the Neanderthals are just another of many extinct species not genetically related to humans. Thus, they are not being referred to when the Bible mentions the formation of man at the end of the creation account. Another thing Christians have debated is the idea that death was absent from the earth before the fall of humanity. Clearly, if the fossil record represents millions of years of life on earth, then animal death has been part of the ecosystem since God first created life. And in fact, the idea that sin brought animal death into the world is not stated in scripture. One of the relevant passages to this debate is Genesis 1 verses 29 through 30 the one we read earlier about man and animals being given plants for food. But like we said then, it doesn't mean animals didn't eat each other. Perhaps all the animals in the Garden of Eden were vegetarians, or perhaps it merely meant that God intended for Adam to live off plants, perhaps for safety or health reasons. We don't know, but it's hardly definitive enough to say that animals didn't die during or prior to this time. The other relevant passage is Romans 5.12, quote, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. This clearly specifies human death as the consequence of sin, particularly since it's through sin that this death came, and most Christians would agree that humans sin, not common animals. It's also possible that this death is spiritual, in addition to or instead of physical. But either way, it doesn't mean that animals hadn't died before the fall, and thus, it doesn't contradict the fossil record. Okay, it's time to move on to Noah's Flood. Like Genesis 1, reading the English account of the Flood in Genesis 7 gives one the impression that this was a worldwide event. Let's read verses 11 through 23. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds, so they went into the ark to Noah, by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life died. Thus he, God, blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. And they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left, together with those that were with him on the ark. Young earth creationists have used the flood as the universal answer to phenomena ranging from the fossil record to the Grand Canyon. They say that the massive upheaval of a global flood could explain these and more. However, the flood explanation cannot account for the universally consistent ordering of life forms in the strata. They can't explain the well-defined layers of incrementally formed sedimentary rock, which would have not have resulted from a single settling of mud. The Grand Canyon shows evidence of a very gradual carving, not a sudden gouge from an immense current over several weeks. This is all to say that the flood doesn't refute the evidence for an old earth. But was there still a global deluge? 
There are a number of scientific difficulties with the idea that Noah's flood covered the entire globe, mountains included. First of all, there isn't enough water on the earth or in the atmosphere to cover the entire earth and its highest mountains. Perhaps there were repositories deep underground that God caused to spring up and then drain back away. Plausible, perhaps, if this were the only difficulty, but it's not. Another big problem is the migration of animals like penguins or kangaroos and other creatures that would never have been in the Middle East in Noah's time. Did the koalas swim from Australia in order to get on the ark? And what about all these animals surviving after they got off? Where would the carnivores have found food without driving their fellow survivors to extinction in a matter of weeks? These difficulties raise questions about our initial impression of Genesis 12 being a worldwide event. Could the deluge have instead been a much smaller but still devastating flood that merely wiped out all human life on earth? This leads us to a similar debate as the one over Yom. The Hebrew word for earth used here is Eretz, which also has a very general meaning that according to the theological word book of the Old Testament, has meanings ranging from world to earth to land to territory to region. Thus, the word itself doesn't have to mean the entire globe. And since the source of this record is the only human witnesses, Noah and his family, it is told from their perspective on the earth. Clearly, the flood was unlike anything they had ever witnessed, and extended as far as they could see, covering all visible dry land. Given their limited understanding of the earth's size, it is certainly understandable that they would have considered this to have been a worldwide event. When read from Noah's perspective, the account is not falsified by the idea that it was local. The flood was a reaction to the sin of man, and its purpose was to wipe out mankind. Since man was still relatively limited to a specific geographic region at this point, such a catastrophe would not have had to extend beyond a fairly small part of the earth. As for the land and air-dwelling animals of the region, they too would have been wiped out. To bring animal life back to this desolate region, Noah would have needed to bring animals with him. Otherwise, it may have been many years before distant populations would have made their way back into the area. Now I'll admit that this may be reading too much into the account, but given the natural evidences and the practical difficulties with the global interpretation, I think it's important to consider whether a local interpretation is reasonable. I think it is, and although there are still some difficult passages to put in a local context, when we remember the perspective of the author and the broadness of the word meanings, I don't find this explanation to be a denial of the Bible's veracity. The flood still accomplished its ultimate purpose, a restarting of the human race. As for God's promise to never do such a thing again, this has not been broken by later local floods, because no other flood has ever wiped out the human race. Another interesting point comes from an implication in Genesis 9.10, quote, And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. While it's not really proof of anything and could be referring to sea life not on the ark, the differentiation between every beast of the earth with you and every beast of the earth seems to imply that there was animal life elsewhere on earth that Noah had not taken with him. Which brings up another question. How would both fresh and saltwater fish have survived if all water on earth had been combined? Alright, that's going to have to do for the flood. I know it doesn't exactly set the issue to rest, so I encourage you to research this independently if you're unconvinced. I simply conclude from all of this that the difficulties with a global flood are reasonably answered by a local one, a concept I do not believe contradicts scripture. Finally, dinosaurs. I think it should be pretty clear that an old earth understanding would have to agree with scientists that dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago. How is still a big mystery, but I find it reasonable to theorize that God caused them to die out after they had served their purpose in his creative plan. After all, it's not likely that mammals, including humans, could have thrived on earth with the continued presence of these creatures. As for Job 40-41's through 41's reference to leviathans and behemoths, I used to be convinced that this could be interpreted to refer to dinosaurs, as young earth creationists argue. Now it's true that much of the descriptions of the behemoth sounds like a plant-eating dinosaur, but there are as many seemingly out-of-place descriptions for a dinosaur as there are for something like a hippopotamus. So neither explanation is perfect. 
The same is true of the Leviathan, which sounds a lot like a crocodile with the exception of its breathing fire. So these monsters don't sound quite like anything we've seen in nature or in the fossil record. They do sound like the type of drawings other ancient humans, such as the aborigines, drew in caves. Drawings of fire-breathing dragons, for example. Now we don't believe any dinosaurs ever breathed fire, but if you lived back then and you ran across massive bones of a beast unlike you'd ever seen alive, is it really a stretch to think you might have imagined it as an even more dreadful beast than the bones showed? Perhaps God was referring to the way people in Job's time interpreted dinosaur bones that they may have discovered. I'll admit, this really sounds like a stretch, and it probably is. I'm not completely convinced myself either way. But the interesting thing is that if you write off this passage of the Bible as completely meaningless because of the strangeness of the creatures, you also have to write off the cave drawings of other early humans, and the sustained mythology of dragons that has remained throughout the history of man. The concept of these creatures clearly has an origin somewhere. Perhaps early man was indeed aware of the existence of dinosaurs long before him through fossil discoveries, but not actually seeing them or having advanced scientific knowledge, they imagined these creatures as breathing fire and having characteristics that embellished their greatness. Perhaps, perhaps not. But given the existence of these ancient mythologies, I'd say it's at least plausible to conclude that perhaps God was using dinosaur bones that people in Job's day had interpreted to be dragon-like or otherwise terrible monsters to explain his power. I know a lot of this has been pure speculation. The thing is, the traditional interpretations of creation taking place in an actual week and the flood covering the entire globe are largely based upon just that, tradition. God's revelation and actions were recorded by Noah and others based upon their limited understanding of science, and that was fine. Whether God's people long ago knew exactly how long creation took didn't matter. They understood that God did it, so whether they tended to see it as being a long or short event was of no spiritual significance. But it did lead to a traditional interpretation of God's revelation that has influenced subsequent generations. Had the patriarchs known what we know about the world and science, they may have made more technically precise observations, and God may have seen fit to point out to them more specific details. I think acknowledgement of this is important in understanding how science and the Bible do in fact corroborate one another. This wraps up our treatment of natural science in the Bible. I think the most important point we should take from all of this is that belief in the Bible does not require us to ignore science or the evidence in God's creation. Rather, the evidence in God's creation can help us better understand what He has explained in His Word. I don't think for a minute that you have to choose between the two. I find scientific discovery fascinating because it complements the revelation we already have and reveals the answers to many of the mysteries surrounding how God constructed our magnificent universe and world. I think ignoring or denying the findings of credible and skilled scientists only prevents Christians from fully appreciating the complexity and beauty of the world God created and the processes by which He formed it. You can certainly still be a Christian and believe in a young earth. I just think you're missing out on some really fascinating details about God and His creation.